Hi, it's Stephen Weigel. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about dynamic tonality because of this item uh, that I have generously received from certain Chris Baysville. Um, this is the X49. Now, when you're using dynamic tonality with it, it is very useful because it's built to be used with the Axis 49, but I would say the DAW isn't very useful. However, if you want to have the advantage of being able to see things from this keyboard, like on the computer, it's kind of um, uh, sort of necessary to use it. Now, uh, explaining the situation with dynamic tonality isn't too tough. Um, essentially, there are three sorts of components to how dynamic tonality works. Uh, one is hex, which is the DAW. Uh, the other two are the uh, synthesizers themselves, uh, which come in a few varieties. I like using the Viking because it always works on my computer. Uh, and there is the relayer uh, part. So basically there's hex, relayer, and whatever synth you decide on, minus the Viking. Um, now, the reason dynamic tonality can be so annoying to figure out is because it's not uh, explicitly stated on the website that you need to use hex and relayers separately. For a very long time, I was trying to use them together uh, to get MIDI data into hex. Now, hex is kind of annoying uh, for various reasons. We'll talk about that later. Uh, but what I just want to do is sort of show you how uh, hex and the Viking need to work together. So now I'm thinking I'm going to switch to screen capture here. Okay, so because the audio in this entire thing is so annoying, I have resorted to doing this particular recording with an external player. So I'm just, you know, I've got a zoom next to me and it's sort of near the speakers of the computer and near what I'm doing here. Uh, so what I'm going to do is first, I am going to go to where I keep all the dynamic tonality since uh, here, I got this folder. Um, and I'm going to open Hex and the Viking, okay? Now, essentially, uh, the Viking is a sort of the receiver of whatever mapping data you want to give it. Uh, now, this can come from Hex or Relayer, which was not made clear to me. I thought at first that Hex uh, was the DAW, and thus it didn't have any mapping data in it. But if you want to record things into dynamic tonality and keep that and have this interface here with the actual hexagons, then uh, you sort of have to use hex to do it and it's very frustrating. Okay, now on the dynamic tonality website, there is a clear direction about how to create the IAC driver bus one. Um, I'm not actually going to do that because I already did it, but I'll briefly just show you where that happens. If you're in the audio MIDI setup, uh, you can go to this window over here and there's a show MIDI studio option and then you'll see I've already done it but uh, if you haven't done it yet you just have to go to this area and you have to create this little object called IAC driver and what that is is it just acts as something you can pass MIDI data to um, like any other thing that you would select in like an audio or MIDI window so the Viking is receiving IAC driver, driver bus 1 which means that uh, hex is outputting it. Now, hex's inputs have to be set like so if you're using an isomorphic keyboard. You want the MIDI port to have the keyboard itself, so in this case the Axis 49. You want the MIDI input type to also be the Axis 49. That is going to be telling you how it's mapped and such. Um, then, you need the track to be on dynamic tonality, because otherwise, uh, you know, it won't act the same. And then the MIDI output port needs to be on IAC driver bus one. So this is the part that's telling uh, the track, hey, send MIDI data out to IAC driver bus one, and then IAC driver bus one can be received uh, by the Viking here. So uh, this should work when I play the keyboard. <laughs> Oh, 
and I'm not sure where the mean tone layout is, but I like to change it to a layout that I actually need to use to make something um, in 13 tone equal temperament here. Uh, well, first I'm going to change it to the synth I like. Uh, magic lead. And, you know, this little diamond changes the spectrum. Uh, not very much, I guess. Um, so, uh, now that I have that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over here and I'm going to go to File Project Settings. Again, not very clear, but if you're in the Project Settings area, this is actually where you change the layout of the keyboard in Hex. Relayer does not do that. You have to do it within Hex itself, which is why Hex and Rela Relayer shouldn't be used together. There's actually no way to get all of the MIDI inputs and outputs to line up if you're using both of them. Uh, and if somebody else has doesn't, has done it, they have not explained it or tried to explain it very well. Okay, so the thing that I'm using is, uh, I guess it's technically father according to some people, but uh, this scale right here. So now I can play this nice scale on the Axis uh, 49. So the little riff I want to uh, write and record just goes... Or at least those are the basic four chords. And then I have some plans uh, with variation on the last part so that uh, the 12 EDO ear is like Zen harmonically tricked into thinking that the first chord can be either major or diminished. So it kind of sounds major here. Still major-ish, you know. But then I have a part where it crawls up. And then... Uh, this part here, the fact that this moves down uh, contradicts with what you would expect from a diatonic scale. So then it makes this chord sound diminished instead of major. Uh, and then there's another similar thing that I'll do. There's a second variation that I have planned where I essentially sort of crawl up and then kind of go... So I just want to record this in hex. Like, this shouldn't be hard. Um, but it is. Now here's the thing with hex. If you save it, you don't really save it. Uh, or at least I can't figure out how to save hex and get it to do anything where it saves the MIDI data. So like, you know, this stuff over here, you know, I'm just not even bothering with it. Uh, now, if you have all this information here with the IAC driver bus one, you should be able to record and input it. Uh, so I'm gonna record a little bit. I'm not going to record what I actually want to do, but I'll just show you how it works. That's good. And then you can play it back. Also, the metronome doesn't work in hex, so I can't sync to a click track uh, or auto quantize at all. So I have to drag all of the notes by hand and copy them. But luckily, I'm making something really repetitive, so that shouldn't be too bad. Uh, so that is how you get things into hex. Now, the hardest part, of course, is, well, since you can't save it, and the only thing you can output or export is MIDI data, then that's, you know, really kind of useless for anything that's not reading in this way. I don't know how I would export a MIDI file and then get some other uh, third-party thing to read it, read uh, the MIDI data in the same way that dynamic tonality would. That is a puzzle for me, and since I don't want to do that, what I do want to do is, uh, well, first, you know, let's pretend I edited this and quantized all of it. Uh, I just need to record uh, the system audio. You would not believe how hard this was for me to find. Uh, now, a lot of people use, like, Soundflower, but I do not use that for various reasons because it's not great and downloading it is annoying now. Um, now, you don't really have any options up here, like in the Viking or in Hex, to change where the audio is going out, but there's only one way to look at it and change it and figure it out, and that's this DSP option right here, uh, which is telling you where the Viking is going out. So what you need to do is you need to change the driver to a PowerSoft, okay? Uh, assuming you've downloaded a PowerSoft. A PowerSoft, by the way, let me pull it up. 
A PowerSoft is like this. It's not the Mac audio recorder, which isn't free, but A PowerSoft audio recorder, just the regular one, is currently free online. So now the status is on A PowerSoft. A PowerSoft is great, by the way, because it plays uh, it plays out of your headphones and it plays through system sound. Uh, unfortunately, there's a little bit of lag, but that is not a problem if you have already recorded MIDI into a DAW and you just literally want audio of it. Uh, since it's already perfectly timed after you've quantized it, then it's not an issue to record it. So uh, let's say I wanted to record this audio. What I would do is I would just uh, record a PowerSoft and play it, and it should come through. And since I see a little... Yay, so look at that. A PowerSoft actually got the audio, and after years and years of being incredibly frustrated with Hex, I finally figured out how to get audio from it. So that is how to do it. Um, and then you stop the recording and the audio is right there. So uh, that is really just the entire process of recording something into a DAW using uh, dynamic tonality and getting the audio from it without having to do any other crazy stuff. Uh, it's basically the entire process. I'm going to show you one more thing, though. Um, let me actually close Hex here. <laughs> Save my changes as if I could. Um, okay. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to open Relayer now. Um, and when I open Relayer, uh, I am going to have all of the stuff here. So the MIDI controller is using the Axis 49. The controller is also the Axis 49. And then I'm using this same mapping that I like to use. Uh, now I'm just gonna show you how to send MIDI pitch bend to another synth. Uh, we're gonna use Absinthe as my example, although Absinthe is very capable of microtuning. This is what you do if you want the keyboard's mapping to go to another synth. Because, you know, if I just opened Absinthe and had this keyboard, it would be like, you know, impossible to get the notes to go to the right places or whatever I would want. Uh, but using Relayer, I can actually map whatever the keyboard is doing in dynamic tonality to whatever's happening over here. It's just that with MIDI pitch bend, you'll have like all these terrible instances where you can't hold chords because like the, the pitch bend won't work correctly. But monophonically, it works pretty well. So I've got this funky scale here. Oh boy, my... 13 tone scale, which I adore. That's kind of like the major scale. And the synth type is set to pitch bend. If I was sending this to the Viking, I would have dynamic tonality here. But now that I'm sending this to something that's not dynamic tonality related, I have pitch bend clicked. So uh, what I do in Absinthe thus is go over to the audio and MIDI settings. You could do this in any respective synth that you have, wherever you're looking at the MIDI coming in. Now you don't actually want the axis to be coming in. Uh, because then you will just get MIDI data that doesn't make any sense uh, regarding whatever Absinthe is doing. Uh, and you also, here, this is important, you can change the tuning of Absinthe, so you want to make sure that the tuning is set to 12 tone equal temperament in your respective synth, because if the MIDI pitch bend goes to it and it's not 12 tone equal temperament, then you're MIDI pitch bending off of that even further. So you want 12 to be the standard that you are changing with the pitch bend. That is important. So, back to the audio and MIDI settings. Uh, the axis is off. The IAC driver, there it is, that's on. So now that's going to Absinthe and Relayer is sending MIDI pitch bend messages. So now I should be able to play this little chime organ in 13 tone equal temperament. Let's see if I can do it. Yeah, yeah, I can do it. So that's the 5L3S scale. Yep, there it is. Uh, okay, so that's just uh, what I've learned about dynamic tonality. And what you should know if you actually want to use hex to get audio from anything dynamic tonality related. Uh, Thank you for watching. Uh, I look forward to your comments, questions, all of that kind of stuff.